Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another crafting project. I've had quite a few requests to show how to make this style of brooch. I've been wearing this light purple blue kind of little moth brooch here on the channel, uh, often in intros, and I think I might have worn it in a lookbook one time, but I wear this one quite often and I've had a lot of requests for this shape or style of moth brooch. Of course, I've done the open winged moth here on the channel before, so if you'd like to see me make an open moth winged version of this, an emperor moth. You can see that in this video here. And I've made many beetles here on the channel as well, so I can just link to the crafting playlist. But today I'm going to be making this slightly more relaxed moth, a, a moth who is resting instead. And I think today I want to use sort of copper and patinaed copper kind of colors, turquoises and browns. So let me get all my supplies out here and I'll meet you over the desk. Yes, I've got a little velvet beading mat, these kind of like placemats, if you will, that um, sometimes bead shops sell, and I have several left over from when I worked at a bead shop. And I have several different colors of sequins and beads I think I might want to use to make another moth like this one. And I have a piece of craft felt here. This is actually a wool blend felt, but you can use regular crafting felt for this as well. I like starting with a felt base. And I'm just going to roughly sketch on a sort of upside down heart shape as the basis for my moth and the top of the head sort of area here. I'll just make a circle at the top and kind of bring the wings down to kind of delineate the body on the inside here. And then I will begin my embroidery by using turkey stitch or Turkish rug stitch to fill in the circle at the top here for the head and the beginning of the body of my moth. Make it nice and furry and fuzzy. Of course, moths don't actually have fur. They are modified like scales and part of the ectoskeleton in some way. So it's not hair in the same way as like a mammal has hair, but they do look quite fuzzy and that's the effect I'm going for here. Now to create this stitch, I have six strands of embroidery floss, just standard embroidery, craft embroidery floss. I have chosen three different colors and took, taken two strands from each to create this kind of variegated look here and supposed to just using one color. I like to mix the colors. Sometimes I'll use shades and hues of one color and sometimes I'll use contrasting. Um, it can be nice to do like four strands of black and two strands of white to have a nice little bit of a flecked look, something like that as well. Today I have a blend of teal shades here and I'm just going to make little loops that are about a centimeter long here. And then I take a second stitch, a small little stitch over the beginnings of the loops to secure it down. So each stitch is technically two stitches in some ways. You have the loop created on the top surface and then a little stitch to secure it. You have seen me do this stitch before in the other moth brooch video. So if you'd like to see me doing some more of this and explain it again, I do show how to do this in the other moth video as well. But I'm going to fill in the entire top area of this with that turkey stitch um, and all these little loops. And then I will show you how I cut these down to create the kind of velvet tufted top of our moth here. I do just have this on like a sturdier sewing needle here. Um, I'm not very good at needle types. Uh, I use beading needles for the rest of this, but when I'm doing the embroidery floss, it's hard to thread this many strands of thread through a beading needle. So I just use a regular sewing needle for this. But once I have the entire area up here pretty densely filled in, I'm just going to take my embroidery scissors here and cut the ends of all of those loops. So we're basically creating a very small little patch of velvet or of like rug here on the top of our buddy. And of course you can then trim the hair or the velvet in any which way you wish. But first you have to cut all the loops. So that's what I'm doing here. Just slipping one end of my scissor through all the loops and clipping all of them that I can find free like so until we have a grassland <laughs> to work with. Now this other little moth here, what I've done is I've just basically uh, done a little bit of a fade on this buddy. So the center I've left long and then I'm gonna cut the sides in a sort of a spherical way. So I'm just gonna give them a little trim along the sides here so that the middle of the head and body area is a little bit of a longer fringe on this buddy. And then I will just trim the sides down. So it just kind of gives it a little bit of a domed haircut as it were. You can see I really am just giving my haircut and I'm fluffing up the resulting shape just with the end of my scissors. And I will take the rest of this scrap fuzz away. get rid of some of those scraps. And now we have our top of our furry little moth friend. Um, and I will go ahead and use a beading needle. Like I said, I just get these at the craft store at Michael's and I'm going to take regular Guterman all purpose thread in a nice teal shade here. Now I have these square beads that I've been told are called Tila beads. Um, I think Tila or Tila beads here. Uh, these I can link below. I picked these up on Etsy. They are on the more expensive side, but I really love the geometric look they give kind of a pixelated look depending on what colors you're using or more of a almost climped painting or even a uh, impressionistic painting kind of look 
using these square beads. They do have two holes through them, so I will go down one side of the bead and then I'll come back up the other side. And I have some regular size 11 seed beads here as well that I will use to just fill in the little triangle, the rest of the body of the moth that is showing here from under the wings. Um, whether or not it looks like it's underneath the wings when we're done, eh, it's fine. From far away, the effect will work. But I just string the beads all on in a like long strand, and then I'm bringing the needle back up from underneath and couching over the thread. So I'm using this needle, bringing it up from the back, and then I will secure the thread that is in between the beads. So needle up from the back, taking a little stitch over the string holding my beads onto my moth temporarily, just securing that down. And really having a variety of sizes of different seed beads and different shapes of beads and different shapes and sizes of sequins, I think is what really gives these, um, you know, more of a unique or intricate look. Of course, I have a huge collection of beads and sequins at this point built up from both Cartwright Sequins, who I can link below, another sequin shop I recently discovered on Etsy that ships all the way from India. It does take about six to eight weeks to get those sequins, but they are really unique. So in my opinion, it's worth it. And, uh, you know, get you get a surprise several months later when they finally arrive in the mail. And then I do like shopping for beads online as well. So I can link a couple of the Etsy shops that I frequent when looking for different colors and uh, finishes of seed beads to add to my collection of materials. And where this little triangle tapers down, I'm just going to finish that off with some seed beads and some like little tube beads, which I can't remember the name of those right now. Little barrel shaped beads. You know what I mean. And again, all of that will just be couched down with stitches over the thread like so. So we've used turkey stitch and couching so far. Those are the two embroidery techniques that you could look up further if you want to have further instruction on that because am I the best embroidery teacher? Probably not. I think I'm better at teaching pattern drafting than I am at teaching embroidery. Uh, this is even more like of like a fluid, I'm just creatively picking and choosing as I go and not really thinking about things very hard as I go. I'm almost just like painting, but with beads and thread instead of pigments. And then the top of the wings here on either side, I'm just going to fill in with a little bit of split stitch. Um, it's almost like satin stitch. Uh, I really kind of filter between the two. I'm not very mm, perfect about it, but I'm just gonna fill this top area in here. Again, I have four strands of embroidery floss on my needle this time, and I do have two different colors mixed in there. So I have two strands of a very light teal and, and two strands of like a soft aqua color, just again, to give that a little bit of variation a little bit of shimmer to it without actually having shimmery threads, just using two different colors to create a variegated effect. But I'm just gonna fill this little top triangle area here. It's like one centimeter triangle, little equilateral triangle here kind of at the top next to our fuzzy head of our moth. And then I'm going to use French knots all the way around the little body bit just to kind of outline it and anchor that area before I start filling the wings in with sequins. So I'm just bringing my threads up from the bottom through the felt, wrapping the needle three times and then putting the needle back down while I hold the thread, twisting that to bring it through and the little three wraps around the needle get tied into a knot. This is called a French knot. I use these a lot in my embroidery work. So you've probably seen me do them before, but again, yes, needle up from the back, wrap it around three times, needle back down through the fabric just to create a little knot on the surface. I really like this technique for filling in lots of spaces or outlining things. You can create little flowers with this. You can do lots with French knots. I will just go ahead and outline the entire little beaded section of the body here with these French knots before I get started on the sequining. All right, so I'm going to come up here within our little split stitch section at the top and grab some very small sequins. These are size three sequins probably. Um, sequins do come in sizes. Again, if you go over to Cartwright Sequins and fall in love with sequins like I have, um, you can grab these in any size and color you could ever imagine. And what I'm going to do here is both gradate the color and the size of the sequins as I go from the top of my moth to the bottom of the wings. So right now I'm using tiny little size three sequins. These are flat, sort of blue teal kind of colored sequins here, sort of a dark turquoise color. And I'm gonna use three or four of those. I'm just stitching them on. I bring the needle up from the back uh, half a sequins width away from the last one and then I put the needle back down right below the last one and that's how I'm going along here. These are all going to be flipped sort of up 
and then you can move them all down in a moment so i'll show you that um, but i'm just doing a row of sequins all along the outside here and then again i started picking up these size five cupped sequins these are not very fully cupped these are kind of half cupped sequins these were just the right color i happen to have them in my stash they've been hanging around a very long time i have no idea where they're from and then i have these lighter turquoise colored kind of textured like otherwise flat but have a texture to them sequin that have a little bit of a gold finish on them these were from that indian seller i mentioned i think it's called ideas to sequins on etsy's where i picked these ones up and they're this nice turquoise with a bit of a antique brass patina on them and i ended up going with antique brass and teal for this instead of copper just because it will better match a suit that i've been making here so i'm planning to wear this on a jacket that i have here in the studio so i was looking over at the jacket and seeing what would pair best with that and the last and largest size of sequin here these are probably a size 8 or 10 sequin in a again strange finish this is a gold snakeskin print sequin so you know i have some weird materials here in the studio i highly recommend it honestly they're not too expensive to collect weird beads and stuff so if you're really into this kind of craft um you know i recommend it honestly it's very fun you feel like you're collecting jewels, even though it's just sequins. But I'll stitch on a few extra of the largest size down here. At the tip of my wing, I am going to do another row back up the side here, using the same colors of sequins and different sizes as I go. So again, I'm just gradating the color, getting lighter as I go down, switching, of course, to that gold at the very end, and then also gradating the size. So sequins get smaller as we go up to the top of the wing and the top of this sort of triangle on this side. And then after those two rows of sequins, I decided to mix it up by doing three rows of beads. So I'm just stringing on some different beads here. I wanted to make it look almost kind of like there were some aqua colored spots here or like, uh, like leopard spots on this moth. I don't know what breed of moth this is or species rather, but I'm using a very small size 15 green iris Charlotte cut seed bead here. I'm using these regular size 11 seed beads in a turquoise blue, some different little triangle shaped seed beads that I have, and then finally finishing up with again, some gold at the tip of the wing. And now that I have those all strung on as one long strand, I'll bring my needle up from the back and couch that entire strand down right up next to those sequins. So it's nice and packed in there. So just lots of couching again to hold that strand where I want it. And I will feed on another strand of beads. This time, again, I'm using the same colors and a little bit different arrangement just to create those little variegated spots on my moth, on my moth wing here. So I have those three strands of beads that I have then couched down. And then I went back to my sequining rows again, starting with small sequins at the top and finishing with larger sequins at the bottom. I switched up the colors a little bit here. So I switched for the smallest sequins from a more blue toned teal to a more green toned teal color that you can see on the left hand side of the screen down there. And then I have these iridescent and almost distressed finished flat sequins here. I think these are a size eight or 10. Again, I'm not excellent with my sizes of sequins as we can tell. Um, and I'm going to use those on the inner parts of the wings here. And I filled in a few little spaces with these. They're just absolutely gorgeous sequins. Again, these are from the Etsy seller, so I can link below to these exact sequins uh, because I've already ordered even more of them because they're just so stunning in person and I can't wait to use them in more projects. But once again, I'm just using that same technique to sew all of these sequins on in these rows. Again, starting with the small sequins, moving the size up and changing the color as I go down to the tips of the wings. And I will fill in the rest of my wing with just these rows of sequins. I do quite like the feathery or scaled look this gives. Of course, actual moths and butterflies are covered in tiny, tiny microscopic iridescent scales. It's most of the time it's the actual physical structure of the scales that give an iridescent finish, both to scales on insects and also feathers on birds. So microscopically, it's not necessarily an iridescent blue feather. It's just the way the structure of the scales are arranged that gives it that flash. I don't know, it's where biology and physics combine to a point where I can no longer understand what's happening. But filling in the rest of this with sequins, like so, I'll just secure my thread off on the underside of this. And my first wing is all filled in. I did include some sort of floral filigree gold sequins and just snuck some of those in there amongst the golden brass sequins at the bottom of the wings here, just for an extra little frilly look. 
And of course, I need to fill in the other wing, the other side, just the same, but I'm going to do that off camera like magic. And so now I have my little moth all completed. This is mostly sequined this time. A little bit of embroidery, a little bit of beadwork, but mostly sequining. Now I'm going to go around the edge of this and slice in little tabs so that I can fold all this extra felt onto the underside. So I don't want to cut around the moth. I like to use the rest of this to sort of pad the underside of the moth. So I'm going to cut little tabs as I go around. Make sure not to cut into your stitches, of course. Don't get too close. And then I can fold all these tabs to the inside, pin them down with these bent pins I keep sitting here on my desk. Um, I have like a little pin cushion here on my desk that where all the bent pins end up after I take them out of projects. And I kind of just use them for this sort of thing where it doesn't matter that they're already bent. Just bend everything to the inside and then I'll just messily secure this all with stitches on the underside of my moth. Um, I'm just stitching the felt to itself here. I don't need to stitch all the way through the moth. And this can be very messy because it's all about to be covered up with a couple other layers. The nice thing about doing mostly sequins too, I mean, if you're like me and you like sparkly things, A, um, is it doesn't take as long as the beadwork. If you fill in a whole moth with French knots, as I've done before, it takes a couple of days to make one of these buddies. Whereas I made this in about maybe five hours, five or six hours, this moth from start to finish. But I have some fine gold wire here because at this stage, before I put on the backing materials and the pin back and all that stuff, I like to secure on any limbs or antenna I want to add. So I'm going to start with the antenna here to make these look a little bit feathery, like sometimes male moths usually have a feathery looking antenna. I like to feed on seed beads, but then also a seed bead, then a sequin, a seed bead, then a sequin. And it kind of gives this, uh, you know, plastic pipe cleaner kind of effect. Also would work well for this pipe cleaners, especially for the moths with like the big fuzzy antenna. I think a pipe cleaner would work very well. I don't have any in my stash, sadly enough. I should get some fancy chenille pipe cleaners if such things exist. But I just kind of bent this little shape, like U shape of wire here with my sequins and seed beads threaded on. And the ends of this wire are just finished by turning them with a round nose plier. And then I kind of flatten that little loop at the end. But that's the only way this is finished. You could also put a crimp at the end or use head pins to do something like this. You know, get creative with your beading supplies to create limbs. And I'm just going to secure the center of this down to the top head of this little buddy using blanket stitch. And then I will bend my antenna into shape and give the body of this a little bit of a uh, arrangement for his hair, <laughs> even though it'll get messed up again in a moment. And then I will make the legs um, in the very same way. Moths, I think, have six legs, but I'm only going to do two on each side. So I'll only give this guy four total. And that's because I assume his last set of legs is being hidden underneath the wings somewhere, you know? So I'm just going to do two on each side again, just kind of bending the wire into a little bit of an H shape to give me something to sew down to the side of my moth here. Again, using blanket stitch for that. And once I have everything secured on, again, I will bend those legs. I kind of just pinch them into this little arrangement so it looks like he's perched on my shoulder or wherever I end up pinning this brooch. On my hat, in my hair. It'd be very pretty to like decorate an Art Nouveau hairstyle with lots of these bugs. Or maybe I just think so. And again, arrange his little hairdo. Now the back of this is a mess, I'll grant you. We're going to go ahead and cover that. I have a piece of buckram here. It's sort of like a cotton or paper structure that's been stiffened with a sizing uh, used for hat making often. But I just have a little piece of that that I cut to shape and I'm just going to stitch that onto the felt at the back here. Again, it was just like large whip stitches, basically. Because again, this step will be covered. Anytime, anytime something will not be showing, I'm worried more about structure than I am about how pretty my stitches are. Because this will be covered up with a final piece of felt cut to size here. But before that, I want to put on my pin back. Now, it'd be very easy just to glue this on here, but I don't like to wait for glue to dry. And I didn't want to use something heavy like hot glue, so I usually just stitch those on. So I stitched that pin back on here. Now, for the final backing, a lot of people use leather or like moleskin kind of stuff. For this, I just use another piece of felt. I kind of like the stickiness of felt. I feel like it helps keep the brooch in place on my clothes. But I'm just going to mark where the pin back like hinges are on this felt with a Sharpie and then just put little slices in those so that the pin like functionality can be stuck through this piece and the bar of it can be extra secured and extra hidden by the rest of this felt piece. So that's usually how I finish up the backs of these these days. And then I'll go all the way around the edges of this just with my thread that's hanging down here. I just leave my thread from securing the buckram on, leave it chilling until I need it again. And I'll just go around the edges of this piece of felt and secure them down with blanket stitch again. You can do this as finely and neatly as you should desire or as messily as you desire. You could also glue this as well. A lot of people use um, leather for this, I've noticed, but eh, I don't have that on hand, but I do have plenty of felt. I can just give this guy a final fluff of his fur and bend of his 
limbs and antenna here and this brooch is technically all finished now with my blanket stitch holding that backing on it's ready to be worn and loved and i am quite happy with how this one came out i'm really happy with the antique bronze and gold colorway mixed in with this verdigris teal and turquoise colors And here is my finished folded moth brooch. It's very cute. I'm excited to wear it in the future. In fact, in the very near future, which you will see shortly. I hope you enjoyed seeing this project come together today. And thank you so much as always for watching. I'll be back with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and the occasional crafting project real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye.